Well, I guess I will give the token to Jeff, but I just wanted to mention this is the last seminar for the semester. Uh, I wanted to thank everyone for joining and especially wanted to thank uh, Shelly Felkamp and Kate Godwin for helping organize them. So Jeff, the floor. Okay. Thank you. It's my real pleasure to introduce the speaker today, Ima. Uh, he got his PhD from Berkeley in 2000, uh, in 2000 and then went straight to Illinois where he rose through the ranks uh, from assistant associate professor. And then his career started becoming more um, diverse, shall we say. He uh, uh, went to uh, lead a group at Microsoft Research Asia. He became an executive dean at the new Shanghai Tech University. Uh, and too many other affiliations for me to list now, but uh, he's now back as a professor at the University of Berkeley, uh, University of California at Berkeley. Um, he is extremely well known for contributions in a wide variety of fields, um, you know, computer vision, machine learning, compressed sensing, signal processing. He gets about five to 6,000 citations a year for his work in all these fields with an amazing more than 50,000 citations to all his work. So I couldn't begin to scratch the surface of the many things he's really known for. But I'd especially mention that he's a fellow of three societies, IEEE, ACM, and, and SIAM. So with that, I'm really looking forward to hearing your presentation on, on first principle neural networks. All right. Thanks a lot, uh, Jeff, for uh, the invitation and having me uh, give a talk. And, uh, um, always excited to, to you know, um, I was in Illinois for 20 years. Um, I sort of apologize that I didn't really know that Illinois, uh, the Michigan and Illinois has a different time zone. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, good. Uh, so uh, today I'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, something probably on many people's mind uh, in the past few years, right? So deep networks. Um, Jeff mentioned that uh, I was the manager of the Microsoft Research Asia, Beijing for about five years and uh, had a wonderful opportunity. I was the manager of the team at uh, uh, Sun Jian and uh, Kai Min. Actually, uh, Kai Min was my first recruit to, to the team. Uh, he's also, of course, the inventor of the residual networks everybody uses these days. Uh, ever since then, right? So I, I, I also worked in computer vision as a sort of a very on the practical side. And we use those tools, right, the networks to, to learn, um, um, uh, to do to solve recognition reconstruction problem in computer vision, but for many years that uh, we so always uh, we so baffled that uh, uh, the deep network still as a black box, right? It can fit the input of the data, but that's probably it. And there's a lot of you know ways to interpret or explain and so on, but mostly stay on the very heuristic side, right? And try to explain uh, different parts, components, or or different phenomena associated with neural networks. All right. Uh, you know, why certain mechanism works, drop out, normalization, you know, that um, uh, the overfitting or even the generalizability or vulnerability to robustness as well, of course. People actually try to understand. So this is sort of a work we did in the past couple of years, um, really trying to uh, gain some deeper understanding about uh, the deep neural networks. Um, and so, Ever since the revival of neural networks, right, the, all, the networks themselves has been the study, especially from the theoretical side. People try to understand why neural network works. And, um, right, so they study one type of structure, one type of operator, one type of uh, you know, simplified the network, the first layer, second layer, and so on and so forth, right? Try to explain uh, what they may be able to do, what maybe they are doing, right? Um, so we also have worked uh, on that front uh, a little bit, you know, even before this, uh, try to understand maybe the overfitting problem, the robustness issue, right? So after a while, we, I get a little bit frustrated, right? Uh, in, in one, on one side, because I sort of work on both sides, right? A little bit on the practice and a little bit on the theory. We saw this huge gap between us, right? Uh, yes, theories try to understand a little bit bits about the neural networks, but somehow failed to really providing any truly useful guidance um, uh, to the practitioner, what they should do the next, or really providing a systematic understanding of why you are, uh, what, what you are really doing, right? And hence that the practitioner don't care, right? They just try with their GPUs, with different ideas, uh, either push out new, new tricks, new, new, new things, right? For a while, we feel like even on the theoretical side, we're sort of chasing the tails, right? Um, understanding uh, things. 
uh, if you don't mind, I'll switch to my uh, uh, the iPod. Probably that's use, uh, better. Uh, the microphone on my computer is a little bit less. Uh, let's give it a second. All right, it's been fine so far, at least on my end. The quality's been yeah. fine. Um, well, I, uh, they will complain. Hey, Yee, let me know uh, when you're on the iPad. I can make that a whole. I'm, com I'm connected. I'm connected. Yeah. But does this work better? Is this this works? Okay. Here. Sounds the about the same better, to yeah. me. Both good. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, because the the my computer, my you know my student complain. You know, after a while, make you know has some clicking sound. Like, I don't know why. Okay. Good. So, so after a while, so this this sort of you know since the early days of pandemic, give us a little bit of time, right? Um, we start to do some soul searching, right? Um, what really is going wrong with uh, deep learning, um, and can we go back to the drawing board, understanding things a little bit, ask us some tough questions, um, tougher questions that we try to almost try to avoid in the very beginning, um, and instead of treating neural networks, we try to get back to the roots of learning. What are we learning trying to do, right? Um, the fundamental uh, tasks in learning, clustering, classification, why do we do it, right? Then if we want to do them well, what is the right approach? Well, right? And then in this way, hopefully that uh, we actually realize that uh, a more fundamental uh, perspective to look at those tasks is actually from the data compression. I'll give you a little bit of background on that. And suddenly we realized that, you know, the maybe the network is really trying to, um, in addition to uh, clustering, uh, classification, uh, classifying the data, is actually trying to learn a representation of the data, right? Again, the principle from data compression provides a way to look at it, right? What we said is that in order to measure the goodness of the representation, uh, there is a natural object uh, objective, we call it uh, uh, rate reduction. And then, once you have that objective, you start to realize that deep networks are actually nothing but the means to the end, right? They will arise very naturally as the most natural approach to optimize such objective, to help to achieve that goal, right? So hopefully this gives us a, a new perspective or a program to uh, understand deep learning or deep networks in a more principled and rigorous way. So then let's forget about deep networks for a while, right? Uh, we, will, we will do that in the first part of the work. We try to understand what we're trying to do with learning or data science or data analysis, right? So let's start with very simple, very minimal assumptions, right? Um, we're dealing with data. Um, maybe deep become, belongs to multiple classes and definitely each class will be separable to others, right? Something distinguish one class from others. We don't know what yet. A very minimal assumption is that maybe those data, so because they're separable, right? The, the data will be multi-mode. And each class, especially when we're dealing with high dimensional data, those, 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 each mode will be highly likely to be de degenerate, lying on some low dimensional sub manifolds or low di no dimensional degenerate distributions. Right. So those are the very minimal assumption we start with. Now we start to ask the question, right? What do we want to do with it? Um, there's gazillions of names people gave into what they do with pattern recognition, you know. Uh, so it turns out to me, I mean, really that uh, there are three fundamental tasks, right? Um, one is that when we have the data given to us, we try to interpolate the data, try to figure out which data are, who are my neighbors, who are similar to me, who are dissimilar to me, right? It's really trying to identify if the data is a multi-model, then which, which samples, which subset belongs to the same structure, the same cluster, same segment, same group. Right. If we can understand, if we are able to do a good job with interpolation or with this, then we become a little bit bolder. We can extrapolate, right? Determine if there's a new data comes in, we can to decide which cluster, which structure the new sample belongs to. Right. So this is all about data uh, analysis, uh, using data to understand data. Right. Um, now. We are not necessarily just satisfied with, you know, dealing with raw data and uh, compute against them, right? Maybe want, we wanted to extrapolate or making the making a model out of it, right? If my data, all the data points seems to lie on a straight line, I only have to remember two numbers, right? And then find a more compact representation for it. However, once you allow to do that, maybe you can add additional requirements on what kind of representation, what kind of model you might be looking for to represent your data that helps you understand the data structure or maybe generalize it better. 
So a few years ago, about 10 years ago, I mean, the neural networks come along, right? Uh, so, so let's just lump everything together, right? So this is, you know, what I said before, this is all we try to understand. Keep in mind here, where our focus is on the data, the structure of the data, right? The neural networks comes along is that, well, let's forget about that a little bit. Uh, let's just try to lump all that things into the mapping problem, right? I have all the data, I try to map the labels, class labels, try to learn such a um, complicated mapping from the raw data to this, right? This has seen a lot of tremendous empirical success, right? One way of doing it is just enforce that the outcome of your uh, neural network, whatever, uh, is match correlate with your uh, label vector the best you can, right? While the object function is cross entropy, right? And it has seen a lot of, you know, uh, empirical successes. Be able to fit natural uh, the, the a lot of var variety of data, and uh, but there's actually a big elephant in the room, right? Um, everybody probably knows, but very few people really talk about it, right? We all know that when the network is large enough, right, and the 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 the, the expressiveness of the, the network is very very big, right? You can actually uh, from for images, for example, you can arbitrarily scramble the label, and you can arbitrarily even scramble the pixels, right? The network will be able to fit. Then you start asking, if I do that, what have I learned, right? All the internal nodes and the features, what are the ge geometric statistical uh, meaning of those? It's not very clear, right? Even with the true label, uh, right? You, you, you learn it, it's not still not very clear. Even till this day, right? People are able to just visualize one node at a time, even just approximately through some deconvolution or decoding, right? That's how limited we know what we're, we actually have learned about, uh, um, uh, about the data. And then let alone, I mean, there's other issues, right? And uh, the, the, the current framework is very task dependent. If I change the labels, I have to retrain the networks, right? And also if I change a task, I have to retrain the networks. There's also the catastrophic forgetting business and so on. And also it's actually not that robust, right? Very small perturbation to our input and it can dramatically change the output. And people know that it's very vulnerable uh, despite uh, the many, many uh, the practitioner will tell you otherwise. So there has been some attempt to, to try to, you know, from a theoretical point of view, to try to understand right, what the neural network might be doing, right? This is the information bottleneck hypothesis, so, which suggests that maybe the network, the mapping is trying to extract sort of the minimum statistics that allows you me to interpret in the, la the, the label, all right? I find the, the minimum features, right? The map can help me to predict the label. Right, hence the mutual information between the, the feature Z and Y, the label Y will be maximized. Yet, the anything that's irrelevant gets thrown away. Right, the the, the so sort of minimize the mutual information between the input and the feature learner. This is actually to a great extent we'll see. Actually, this actually explains a lot of what maybe the the, the, the current neural network practice is doing. Right, you try to find the minimum information features that can kind of correlate to the data, but uh, this formulation is still very task dependent, label dependent. If I change Y, right, um, this whole quantity will changes, right? Uh, and also that the point is that you ask uh, from, from, from a, this does not necessarily help you understand what is the intrinsic structure of X, right? It just says how X may be separated, but what the original structure of X that enables such classification is nothing really said much about it. There's actually a bigger elephant in the room, right? So in the sense that, uh, yes, you can cast what maybe conceptually the network is doing, but the, those proposals of those information theoretical quantities, entropies, right? Or, or inf mutual information or distance between distributions has some limitations computationally, right? Um, for example, when the dimension is high, we're dealing with images, millions of dimensions, right? Computing this quantity, evaluating this quantity is almost impossible. Right, the the, the computation, uh, the, the, the it's just a curse of dimensionality. And also, there's actually even bigger issue. Right, very often we're dealing with a high dimensional data like images. The distribution, the structure of the data actually is degenerate. It's zero measure. Right, hence a lot, most of those quantities I listed above, they're not even well defined. I'm not saying they're wrong, but they're not well defined when you're dealing with degenerate distributions. And of course, in reality, you are just dealing with the finite samples from them, right? It's like, well, that's why in reality check is that, you know, in, in the practice that uh, despite almost many papers in NIPS, right, start with the information theory formulation, but later on they start to do all kinds of simplifying uh, assumptions, right? Or even adding heuristic to it, 
Uh, after several steps, you really don't know, right? Um, if the theory can provide any performance guarantees at all. So this is about 15 years ago. Um, we started uh, getting encounter the problem with uh, clustering classification. We were trying to solve the problem in contribution such as image segmentation or recognition, right? Then we started to realize that even make the simplifying assumption that my data lies on low dimensional subspaces, we have to relook at the clustering classification, the, 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 the classical information theoretical approach or statistical approach to those kind of problems. Right? How to deal with, you have to deal with the low dimensional structure head on. You cannot beat in the bushes. You cannot assume their generic distributions. I pretend all this information theoretical formulation you put down are computable right? or are analyzable. Right? So one thing we realized that is to look at those problems, relook at those problems from a compression point of view. I'll give a little bit overview of that because it's fundamentally connected to what I'm going to talk about, about the deep networks. So let's look at the, the clustering, right? Uh, the interpretation problem. If I have just a bunch of data points um, uh, from maybe for mixed distributions, how do I cluster data, regroup the data, right? So the classical statistics we will do is that we can represent in those distributions as a mixture of distributions, right? Uh, with the proportion pi and the component distribution pj. And we formulate it as a maximum likelihood, right? This classical way or standard way to, to solve this is the expectation maximization. Right. People develop all kinds of alternative minimization to do this. But actually in practice, nobody actually does this, right? In terms of clustering, right? Uh, for real world tasks. Why? Because first of all, those each component may not be hard to compute. And also that uh, again, when you're dealing with high dimensional data, maybe this actually works when the dimension of the data is low, uh, but the high dimension data, very, nobody, very, uh, nobody actually does this, right? It's because they actually degenerate. Many of this component, the maximum likelihood actually blows up. Right. So this is a problem we actually encountered about 15 years ago, right? So it forced us to relook at the clustering. So ask the very fundamental question, why do you want to cluster, right? Yes, the maybe multi-multi model, but why do you want to do that? What do you gain from clustering data correctly, right? So the, so the fundamental idea we realized that uh, from the data compression point of view, so the, the only reason you wanted to cluster your data properly is because your data, if you have this kind of structure, right? If you put, save all the data together as a whole, you, the, 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 the space you need to pay for it is much, much larger if you will be able to separate data in a judicious way that respect the low dimensional or structures, cluster structures. Hence, it's the, if the number of saving the data if, of course, we, we choose a measure, right? Either volume, dimension, or number of bits, right? We're computer scientists, so we, we like to use the bits as the, as the fundamental unit. Hence, we ask the question, if I save my data together, how many bits I use versus separating them separately? Which one is larger, right? So it's sort of the whole, is, if the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, I prefer the parts. Now this boils down to the question, is how do you measure the volume or the number of bits. Uh, turns out there's something very interesting uh, we discovered at the time, right? Um, information theorist has figured this out, right? At least for generic distribution like Gaussian, right? This is sort of really the source coding problem. If I'm allowed to have a data drawn from Gaussian distribution, and if I'm allowed a slack, a slack right? Precision, giving us a precision of epsilon, I'll be able to pack the space, right? This is the, the original idea from Shannon. I can balance the space with the epsilon balls and I'm counting how many balls there are. And that actually gave me the, the log of that number of balls, give me the, the coding length. Turns out, interestingly, uh, this actually assumes that your data is a generic distributions and so on and so forth. Uh, but turns out uh, there's another interpretation of this formula um, that you don't need a statistic uh, formulation. As long as your data lies on low dimensional subspaces, uh, you actually can derive exactly the same formula, same bound, uh, by starting with the quantified SVD. Optimize your quantification for the SVD of the data matrix. And you get exactly the same form. So now this is, imagine this is just a measure, right, of, of the volume of your data. And once we're equipped with this, then you can just have some, you know, start to cast the clustering problem as a compression problem, right? If I can partition my data in the correct way, then the number of bits I pay for after the partition will be much less. If I save them together, I have to encode the entire space here, right? 
Although this gives you a measure of goodness of your partition, but it does not help you, does not solve the partition problem itself for you, right? Uh, the, how many partitions there are, you have to try all of them. That's actually combinatorial remaining, right? Um, however, it turns out this measure is very tight, very accurate. It actually enables you to do things in a very greedy fashion. Uh, so at the time we actually find out even just the starting with every data point as its own and merging them in a pairwise fashion, in a greedy fashion, I only merge pairwise of points as long as they save me bits, right? So by just doing that greedy uh, fashion, you end up with extremely powerful clustering algorithms, right? This empirically, this algorithm actually converts to global optimal despite the large uh, volumes of uh, the outliers and noise. And also accept very striking sharp phase transition behaviors that uh, you know, to, to this day, we still don't understand why that works. So this is actually the results. But despite that, we actually, it's time we actually found that this is the works very, very well as, the, as a custom algorithm, gave you the state of art segmentation on natural images. Of course, shortly after that, people start to do deep networks. Everybody's doing supervised uh, segmentation, right? Again, this is just show that this is without any heuristic, just do compression alone you get a state of art image segmentation. So after that, we were a little bit encouraged, says that, oh, maybe this, maybe this extends to classification as well, right? Before uh, this, people, I just started doing, okay, let's formulate it as a mixture distribution, then solve the maximum likelihood estimation problem, and that's giving me a classifier, right? You learn that in st classical statistical books, right? But in reality, nobody does this. Everybody talks about this, nobody does this in reality, right? For classification problem, that's why, you know, especially when it's high dimensional data, people do SVM, people do neural networks these days. Yeah, nobody really actually do this. Why? Again, right, same issue. It's not very computable, the, the, the distribution are degenerate. We actually realized that's a problem at the time, uh, back 15 years ago. Uh, we said, that, okay, now can we extrapolate to this uh, problem, right? The compression framework to this problem, right? Then this actually come up with a very fundamental basic idea. So the, the only reason uh, I can assign the new data points to a cluster is because I maybe by incorporating these data points into the cluster, I pay the minimal number of bits compared to other clusters. That's it. And we call it minimal incremental coding lens criteria, right? Sounds very basic. It's almost like a bean counter, right? We become a bean counter, right? Very naive uh, even, right? But it really has a sort of parsimonious flavor to it, right? Meaning that the simple explanation for the new data is the one that wins. Does this work? Turns out that actually this, this sounds very naive criteria, right? But actually that's the best thing, right? The theoretically the correct thing, right? If your samples goes to infinity, this actually criteria converged to the correct regularized back and also regularized by the dimension of the data, uh, the, the, the distribution. Meaning that if the likelihood are the same for two cluster and the classification will prefer the one with a larger geometric dimension of the distribution, so the error on the side of caution. It does all this automatically through this very basic bean counting business, okay? Implicitly, right? So at the time, we actually, uh, this is actually one of the NIST paper we published, we actually saw a truly extrapolating sort of near subspace classifier, right? And the, the, the never seen samples on the left-hand side, but yet the classifying boundary really respect this low dimensional as if this low dimensional structure extrapolates all the way, right? And you don't get that from other kind of classifier, nearest neighbors or SVM, you don't, right? And so this, so at the time we were very, very uh, happy, right? This, this, this classifier seems to really doing the right thing, right? It's really discovered the low dimensional structure and uh, utilize that for extrapolation for classification. However, Right, uh, it's actually not that very useful. Why? Well, it's long parametric. You realize, right? That you in order to incorporate your computing the coding lens, you need to do compute data against data. Second, right? This this measure is really, as I said, the measure is really for Gaussian or subspace like, right? It's good for that kind of configuration. But what if your data are nonlinear? At the time, we propose use a kernel, but again, it's kind of wishy washy, right? Which kernel to use, and so on and so forth, right? So, but it's good enough to publish paper and we moved on, but we know we, we did something right. Um, Yi, Yi, can I ask you a clarification about the, the slide before, uh, the previous slide, slide 18. Um, 
I thought you were moving away from the Gaussian mixture models and towards this coding. So what is the likelihood it's in this expression? Ah, so this is actually still Gaussian, but if in case your data covariance, covariance matrix is degenerate, it actually regularized uh, the, the, it actually using the lossy coding, the epsilon, the is actually will regularize this inverse. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. And still uh, a, a Gaussian, implicitly still dealing with degeneracy and the Gaussian. Okay, so you're analyzing yeah. the, if it were a mixture of Gaussian, this is how well it would perform, I guess. Exactly. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Or it converts your first order uh, or second order statistics of the of the data, each cluster. Yeah, right. approximate each cluster as Gaussian. Yeah. So that brings us to today, right? Um, now, remember those two issues, long parametric issue and also nonlinearity nonlinear, issue. Can we resolve that? Here comes is that um, there's probably nothing you can do if you just force yourself to work with the original data. Now, what if I'm allowed to change the data, right? I'm allowed to deform the data, right? Find a representation, find a mapping from X to Z, right? So then, then I, I'm, I'm not, I have a chance to, first off, if my data, I start to be able to find a model for the data. Second, if the data is nonlinear, original structure is nonlinear, maybe I'd be able to linearize it. And also, maybe also I can sneak in something more, right? If, since I'm, a, I'm, I'm looking for a representation, I might as well make it useful, right? And if the data in the original space is barely separable, maybe I can make them more discriminative in the, in the final representation, right? So just like a linear system, which should convert to some canonical form, right? So you ask yourself, what is a good representation then? Then why deep network arises, right? You know, put that in the back burner. Uh, we'll think about, we'll get back to that. So, Think about if I'm allowed to do this transformation, then you know, what put down your wish list, right? These days people don't do that anymore, right? So just make it very, very clear what you want out of this, right? You're allowed to do this, then what do you want? And from the you know day one of pattern recognition, we don't have to go any further. Just look at the origin of pattern recognition, right? Maybe within class, we want the data to be highly compressible. We want the samples to be close, right? And we want to maybe represent each class with a linear subspace, which is very easy to use, right? You can do superposition and so on and so forth. Between class, we maybe wanted those different subspaces to be incoherent or better orthogonal to each other, right? They're more discriminated. Finally, right, think about, right, the, the, the fitting the label does not help you understand the structure of the data. The learning is really should be about the data themselves, right? So I really want to know all the fit characteristics that allows me to separate apple from oranges, not just the color, right? The fit the label very, very well, maybe the shape, the shape of the leaves and so on and so forth, right? So hence the job is really, if I want to find a good representation, the representation should reveal the distinguished part of each classes. So we want it to be, have a rich, diverse representation. Is there a measure of good? Then the question is, how do you measure? If I gave you, gave you any representation in terms of those wish lists, how do you measure which one is good, which one is bad, right? The cross to be maybe is not very good as we say, right? So. Uh, you know, the recent work from Donald's group shows that if you train with the cross entropy, in the end, the, the dimension of each class, right, converge to one dimension, right, that they call it the neural collapse during the terminal phase of deep learning. It doesn't really help to reveal the structure of the data. This connects us to the data representation problem, right? So if I'm allowed to find a representation um, mapping from X to Z, right, so how do I measure this? So to measure those different classes, if I give me a dimension D space, that's my you know, um, currency, right? That's all the resource I have. Then maybe I want to use all of that, right? The feature needs to be really distinguished from each other. So then the rate reduction or the coding, average bits per, per sample, right? We call it the rate now, not the length. Here we care about the average coding lens. That this expression gives us a measure of the volume of your feature, all the subspace, uh, all the subclasses, right, together. Now, if your data has internal intrinsic structure that are separable, right, then if you partition them correctly, right, then the volume or the average coding rate for each class, I can write it down, right, this one. Don't be scared by this expression. This is just exactly the same as this one, except uh, here, uh, pi just stored out the which points, each which column belongs to the same cluster, right? So I only measure, this is a, each of the, there are K clusters, right? Each, this is just the, the coding rate for that particular cluster and then take an average, right? So pi, pi ij is just the, the ice element 
the i's columns of z belongs to the j's class. That's it. It could be one zero 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 or could it be a probability assignment. Uh, either way works. Now you have a measure for the total. You also have a measure for the parts. Then what do you really want? Right? One thing, remember that the wish list, we want a different class to be distinguishable. Naturally, you wanted to maximize the coding rate for the total and the parts, right? So we want to expand all the features as large as possible, but yet compress each class as small as possible. This is kind of really kind of the slogan is that similarity contracts and the dissimilarity contrasts, right? So that's why in literature you saw there's actually, uh, incidentally, there is a contrastive burden, it's contrastive burden, right? And they're just very attacking this problem from a different side of the point. Why we do this? Very intuitive. Despite this formula looks a little bit ugly, but actually very magical, as we'll see later. Um, and um, But it has a very, very naive interpretation. It's a bean counting business, right? As I said, we're all bean counters now. So really that if you remember this, if your data lies on two lines, the left and right intrinsically, they're the same, right? Basically they, they say the data on two lines and the volume for the data, the, the green balls are very much the same, right? Yet extrinsically, they're very, very different, right? And this is embedded as orthogonal subspaces, right? So how, hence the, the whole space spanned by the data, the total number of balls you can pack in the space is much larger than this one, right? And the one thing this, uh, the distinguish this two is that the, the blue balls, exactly the space in between, right? We want, if we maximize that, they will push the two subspace into orthogonal uh, incoherent uh, configurations. That's what this, this, this uh, rate reduction, we call it the rate reduction is really doing, right? This difference between total and the parts. And hence you can make this formal, right? If we're allowed to deform my data, I can measure the goodness after deformation in terms of the rate reduction, right? How big the reduction is. And this is just counting the number of blue balls in the space in between, right? Now, then you said, oh, well, if you just want to maximize the number of blue balls, what if I just make the size of the right-hand side twice, twice or larger, right? Now, of course you'll cry fall, right? I mean, that's not fair. Right. In order to make the comparison from left to right to fair, what do you have to do? The scale has to be the same, right? So that's all there is, right? So in the, in the practice, people do all kinds of normalization between layers, right? So in order to compare two representations learned by two networks or representation learned at a different layers of network, right? You have to compare them fairly. So do you know you are improving or you are decreasing, right? You are not improving. Right. People do batch norm, layer norms, instance norm, group norm. God knows what, how many other norms they're going to come up with, right? They're going to write a paper that says that each of those norms are better than others. No, they're not. They're all equivalent mathematically, right? It's a choice for convenience. Then finally, is this object function, the reader action give you the wish list? Um, turns out under very broad conditions, it does, right? The configuration, the features, the final features, achieve the maximum rate reduction of precisely each class belongs to orthogonal subspaces. Not only that, the, the features within each subspace were distributed almost isotropically, basically span the, all the space you are given to it, you are assigned to it, right? So in a way that they sort of, you know, um, modify Aristotle's slogan, right? The whole is greater than some of the parts. No, in terms of looking for a better representation, you actually want to maximally greater than the part, some of the parts. That's what the, the, the maximum rate reduction is trying to achieve. Also, there has been, you know, work, uh, uh, try to do similar sort of contrasting conjunction, but so I want to worry, right? So encourage low dimensionality. Uh, uh, there's also, you know, nuclear norm can also encourage low dimensionality, but it's convex. It's actually not strong enough um, to do this. Uh, it actually does not encourage, uh, uh, change the neural collapse phenomena at all. And also there's also contrastive learning, contractive learning. Uh, but here I can tell you, uh, tell you that this formulation of course is not only intrinsic, but also it's, uh, it actually can do contrastive learning, contractive learning uh, simultaneously and for multiple classes. Doesn't have to be pairwise images as well, pairwise samples. Does this work, right? So then we can actually do something, right? Just remember, this gave you as a new objective function rather than cross entropy, right? Um, you can actually just do exactly the same as you do with neural networks. Find your favorite neural networks to represent in the mapping 
right? And uh, just replace the cross entropy, uh, the label fitting business with the uh, with rate reduction. And the difference here is that you can actually now we're doing training, you're doing optimization, you are, you are monitoring three statistically and geometrically meaningful quantities, right? You see how things expand, how things get compressed, how the difference increases. And also do a comparison, right? This is, you know, everything else is equal. The data is equal, the uh, networks are equal, the training optimization, everything is equal. The only difference is the object function. Right. This is a, the rate reduction. This is a cross entropy. You can see the cross entropy push all each class close to one dimensional. And even after learning, right, the confusion matrix between the samples, this the test samples, right, still there's a lot of confusion, right. Yet, you know, you see beautiful clean orthogonal representation learned by the rate reduction. Right. You don't see cross talks there at all, or very little. And also one more thing is that you can see that this is the PCA of each class. Remember each class we're mapping to a subspace, right? This is the dimension of each classes and also around the, you know, even around the 12 or 10 dimension. And those principles, remember, we never label those, right? You, you find those coordinates, start to find the images that, that their coordinates lines the best with each of those components. We took 10 out of them, right? You can see this is the bird category, right? Each component actually captures something in, statistically in common, right? And you didn't get that from labels, right? This is done automatically from the sorted out for you. Right? It's the same for the boat. One thing remember, um, the differentiate the label fading and the uh, rate reduction is that rate reduction is try to compress data as a set, right? Remember the robustness about the compression, right? So if there's, there's corruption in your label, 10% all the way to 50%, right? So the, 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 the algorithm will only compress what can be compressed. It will leave those corrupted labels alone, right? Because they don't share anything in common, right? As you naturally see that with the train, this training, I mean, the, 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 the classifier is so much more gracefully degrading, right? Than the cross entropy, right? It's very robust to, 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 to this, right? Because you do not try to actively fade in every table. The network is guiding the wrong direction, right? You try to find something statistically concentrated on the right structure. So this also works for self-supervised learning for the interest of time. I'll, I'll skip this um, if you don't have a label. And the finally, so now the question is, are, are we really happy, right? So you ask yourself, uh, are we satisfied with this, right? So we replace the, the label fading cross entropy with something intrinsic. Right, maybe the object function become more interpretable, right? Statistically, geometrically, and also maybe the feature we learn is also more interpretable. It relies on subspace. They are mutually orthogonal, and so on, so forth. And also, we know the results are more robust now, right? We sort of uh, get rid of this, uh, you know, try to fit every single bit label business, right? And try to identify something common in the data. However, that comes with a big but, right? Uh, how do you represent this, right? We still just borrow neural networks, right? Res that or something, right? Still a black box, right? Also, why is even a deep architecture necessary? How wide and deep? What are the roles of a linear nonlinear operator? Why, why that particular form, right? Uh, also, why multi-channel convolution when dealing with images, right? N nobody explained them, right? What's wrong with separable convolutions, right? We're very used to that in image processing. Why we have to do this in a 3D convolution, right? Why is that? Just practitioner tells you the performance is better, but why? Can we replace black box with something entirely white? The good thing with knowing what you want, right? Be very clear about the, the objective of your object is that you couldn't care less, right? If there's another way or magical way you can find the global optimal of those Read reduction, you're done, right? And you can care less if you use a deep network or not. In fact, if you find a better way, you will be more successful, right, doing this. So one thing we realized that once we realized that we started, oh, can we just optimize this thing, right? Is there other way to optimize this? Um, however, this is a sort of log determinant, kind of ugly, long convex optimization with some constraints, normalizations. Well, fine. Right. Um, if there's nothing clever we can do, I mean, at least we can do gradient descent, right? That's what uh, if you know we learn from the, the neural networks. We let's try gradient descent. So hence we just try to do gradient descent to optimize the z, right, as a variable, push they around, see when they're going to achieve the global 
configuration, achieve the global maximum of this. As soon as you do that, something interesting happens. As I said, there's something magic about this object function, right? The log determinant gradient looks like this, right? You realize there's some matrix hitting the, the data. And also at, at the, this current point. And also the second term is just, again, is to just sort out the data belongs to the same cluster. And this is the operator, the new operator, hit your data in that particular class. That's it. So the gradient of the rate reduction is exactly one term is about expanding. It's a linear operator on the, all the data and linear operator on parts of the data, if you know the partition. For people who are familiar with uh, statistics, right, you recognize those operator immediately. What are they? E multiply Z are exactly the residual from the auto regression of the data, other data points interpolating every data point, right? So it's called doing the, it's really the residual of the auto regression. So imagine zebra fish or any animal, right? They don't know Gaussian distribution. They don't know subspaces. All they know is that it's data from past, right? They have to use, say how the new data points gets interpolated with all the data I've seen before. That's what it is, right? And also the ZZ is really computing the residual of that. If I wanted to push things apart, those are the direction I want to expand. If I want for C channels, right? Those are the residuals my current cluster cannot explain very, very well. Then that's the direction I want to compress, right? That's exactly the positive negative sign in front of it. So schematically, this is already what it does. This picture shows what it does, right? So those are the nine points. Remember, uh, the rate reduction tried to push all the data into orthogonal subspaces, right? That's exactly, and I, I don't know that it conversion, but at least locally, I can do grid extent. I follow, I push every point along the direction can maximize the rate reduction, right? I get this kind of operators, that. On training data, I already know how to deform them, right? But the point is that, how do I define the deformation for points not even on the training data, right? Because I want to find a mapping of the entire space from the origin to the end, right? So, so for data points not on the uh, on the training data, you don't know the membership. What well, don't don't forget what a CZ is. CZ is exactly the residual, right, uh, of these points against each cluster. You already have that. It's at your disposal, right? Remember the incremental coding lens criteria. You build a classifier based on that, you know, and uh, you can just do a soft mask if you want. It turns out that one, as long as you know your task is trying to approximate this, this classifier, right? This gazillion's way of doing it, right? And this doesn't have to be the only way. I mean, if you force your features to be on the first quadrant, the positive, you end up with this can be, this, this, this whole expression can be represented by a actually a random operations approximately, right? By the way, you don't have to be precise. Right? The classification doesn't have to be correct. It's because you're only computing the gradient. It's approximating. As long as it's pushing things in the right direction, you are fine, right? It's, it will converge. Now, if you write down what the optimization does, you get this recursive equation, right? From the previous iteration to the next, follow a gradient. This term is exactly the gradient, and this is your learning rate of step size, eta. Right, and then you do you do this reiteration. You realize that from the original data all the way to the final step steps is actually a composition of map of this form. Right, you hit the linear operators and uh, and also normalize. You're done. Right, we are engineers. If you draw the diagram, you get a scheme a diagram like this. Right, you the, the from previous iteration you pass linear operators, you gating, sorting, you know, uh, and then you 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 weight sum them and you normalize them feature and you get to the next level, right? Iteration. Then now we just call it a different name. Let's just call this iteration as a network, right? That's exactly a network. You actually can comp compare with the previous network the popular one, they, they call it, it's surprisingly they call this residual network, right? And then now we know precisely those are exactly auto residual of auto regression. And the later they found out if you add the parallel channels to the residual network, it works better. I call the res next, right? And do you recognize the similarity between the mega class structure, right? But there's one thing interesting now. All this network, right? It has a similar structure. However, they have be, they are randomly initialized. You have to very carefully initialize them, right? And then then learn learn all the parameter from backpropagation. Here you don't. Every layer, the operators are computed in a forward fashion, right? 
And not only the form, but all the values are computed in a forward fashion. You don't need backpropagation. You don't have to, right? We'll see, we'll talk about backpropagation in a second, but you can, right? And also this is just a dual comparison, even the latest uh, Google's 1.7 trillion parameter switch transformers, right? Google, they can do whatever they want. They have 5,000 GPUs to burn. Um, here they have 4,000 parallel channels, right? If you look at the mega structure, right? There's a router they're doing and exactly has exactly the same meta structure, right? Again, they randomly initialize everything. They have to train the network on entire internet data and get some remarkable performance. Here, uh, we don't do backpropagation, right? You don't have to. And does this work? It actually does, right? So you actually can do, you know, this dissemination shows the basics, right? Um, the, once you realize each layer is just doing optimization, right? It always converge. You could do, 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 do the structure of the network the way that the Red Hood network, right? You can build two sound layers. You don't have to worry about the convergence, blows up or anything, right? It always converge, right? Um, well, you don't need the two sound layers. It's just my student have some fun, right? Because people said that deeper is better. Well, of course, for optimization, the more iteration you take is better, right? But when you reach diminishing returns, you stop, right? You don't do anything unnecessary. So this is the beginning, and you can see that the squeeze every cluster into a one dimension, low dimensional subspace and make the morphogonal, right? Really fast, this nonlinear ICA automatic for you. And for, 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 for many pro practical data, right? Not only we just, this works for vectorized data, right? Um, for practice like computer vision, we also care about additional structure in the images, right? Um, uh, for example, uh, the e we recognition uh, digits, we want to recognize zero and one in arbitrary orientations or at arbitrary location, right? For mathematical simplicity, I here consider translation on the tourist uh, so that we can represent the entire group of translation. It's a become a complete group. Um, here, the, the, the thing is that, um, of course, you can see that there's a traditional convolution neural network was, you know, people say that also can handle, uh, give you the invariants, right? Um, but the people train those with, uh, with some augmentations and so on, right? Um, even with a very highly engineered uh, deep networks these days, in fact, they're pretty, they're in this task, they're not doing very, very well, right? People won't tell you that, but you can do your own test if you don't believe it. Those are the two people did the test, right? With those highly engineered VGG residual networks on, 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 uh, or, or the Google image network, network the image net, right, trend. Uh, you can actually fold them with a very simple transformation, right, very natural. It, you don't have, you have to fold them with a large transformation or translation, very small translation, just around the neighborhood. You actually can make them, the, 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 the results will be very bad. Now, let's try to think about this problem in the more mathematical way, right? What do we really want? Right, to achieve environments. Really what we want is that if I deform my images, transform my images, I want the feature all belong to the same equivalent class. Right, that's it. Right. You can make this very, very rigorous. Now, in our context, since we're looking for subspace representation, right, we're pushing the features into subspace. Basically what we want is that for all the equivalent instances belongs to this, of the same sample, we want to map all that instances into the same subspace in this case, equivalent class, right? So identify the subspace. The question is, can you do that? How do you do that? But let's start with a very simple case, right? If you have a one dimensional signal, um, then all the translated uh, for simpl mathematic simplicity, we consider all the cyclic, tra uh, cyclic uh, shifting, right? We list all the translated version uh, into this matrix as columns, right? Uh, those are the, all the data should belong to the same class, should belong to the same subspace. I wanted to compress them. As, uh, so then, of course, you know, Redo Network is doing that, right? Just put all the data, um, uh, consider all the stack, all the cyclic version, and compress them, right? Then what those operators going to become? I ask, remember all this gradient, right? We're doing gradient descent. Turns out those E channel, C channel, right? Those operators precisely become a convolution. Here, this you know, people don't get this point, right? A lot of people complain, oh, we know, we know use convolution. No, this is actually it's a different perspective, right? Here, you do not stipulate, say, I want the environment since I use convolution. Here is just a, this just to compress data. That if the data has this nature, right? The convolution is naturally, the form comes out from the task you ask for. Second, not only the form, but also the value of the convolution is determined by the data. Uh, also, as 
uh, when we realized this, um, we actually realized something truly fundamental uh, and people have overlooked properly, right? Is that the issue with the separability and uh, subspace model or superposition, right? So imagine that in one class, uh, you have a uh, delta function. If you are allowed to translate this function to everywhere and also allow arbitrary superposition, then this will span the entire space. This will not be separable from any class of data, right? Then you ask yourself the question, then what really makes the class of fish separable from duck? Right? You really cannot allow arbitrary variance as well as arbitrary data generating by superposition, right? The superposition should be sparse in some space, right? The images should be actually sparsely generated against some uh, dictionary of your choice. And between different classes, the dictionary should be incoherent also, right? Hence, really what you try to separate, what's really separable is in the sparse code space. And you can only allow sparse superposition among those data. Allows you to generate fishes, allows you to generate stacks against the dictionary. So instead of separating X, you really should be separating those sparse code. Now, how do you get the sparse code? Well, there's many, many ways, right? Uh, the lazy way is just hit your data with some random filters. If you assume your data has low dimensional structures, right? This is a, a theory from compressive sensing. A lot of things that, you know, enough random filters will allow you to preserve those sparse informations, right? That's exactly what you could do, right? Here, remember, we're not care about, we do not care about representing the image. We just care about a good guess of those sparse codes. So we can separate them, uh, separate the fish from ducks, right? So then you hit with random filters with enough of those and you sparsify those code, sparsify those responses to get this patterns sparse. Then this is a become a feature. This is really corresponding to the lifting, right? We hit the images with multiple channels. We lift it with hundreds of channels, right? This is really the lifting. I explain why you have to do lifting, uh, the separability issue. Now, taking those sparse code and then consider all the shifted environment cases, right? Then, then try to compress them. Something magical happens, right? So this matrix, the E channel, E matrix, the C channel that allows you to do greedy descent, to compress those data, to group those data, map them into subspaces, suddenly becomes multi-channel convolution. Even you started with separate, see, even you start with separable channels, right? One cannot to say. So as long as you do the greedy descent, because the inverse on those block circular matrix, the inverse will start to force all the channels to talk to each other. And that gave you this operator precisely corresponding to a multi-channel convolution. Also, this matrix looks very homogeneous, right? To do an inverse, right? So this is, N could be the number of pixels, C is the number of channels, right? This is really homogeneous inverse, right? Turns out it's not that scary. This matrix has, or C matrix has exactly the same structure. It's the highly structured data. What structure, right? So they're actually block circular matrix. We all know from math that the block circular matrix can be diagonalized by Fourier transform. Therefore, what's inside the, it's really a Fourier transform of those blocks of diagonals or up to permutation, this really become block diagonal matrix. Hence, computing the inverse of this matrix of this type, actually in the frequency domain, after you do the Fourier transform, is only cubic in the number of channels, but linear in the pixels, all right? Instead of cubic in both, all right? So this is actually very, very interesting, hard mathematical evidence, right? Start to realize that it's not, you know, choose the frequency domain, it's not just for convenience. There's actually black and white computational efficiency. You gain all of this by doing this. Learn this kind of uh, uh, network, learn, construct this kind of operator, right? It's much, much more efficient to do this directly in the frequency domain, right? Maybe see there's evidences in neural cortex, right? Neurons precisely transmit or compute information in frequency. That's why they're called spiking neurons. They're not doing the magnitude. Also, there's a difference. Uh, people actually try to build uh, build the neural networks from scratch, right? Using constructive way, right? There are many people probably familiar with. You can use wavelets, for example, as candidates for those filters, right? The, the only problem is that you don't know which filter to use, right? Then you have to use 
uh, of course, in the traditional neural network, you learn, right? You randomly initialize, you learn all those parameters. But here, you, if you want to design with wavelets, you don't know which, you use a complete basis, right? But unfortunately, if you do that, the basis explode, right? The next layer, every branch, you have to use a complete basis, right? That's why the scattering network does not actually only allows you to build a network with two or three layers, right? Cannot go deep. Here, the difference are at least the two, right? The, the Redu network, the E channel, C channels are automatically, remember, they are computed from the previous layer, right? The, the number of channels stays constant. Why? Because they're computed from the data. They're only computed from the K class of data you gave them to me, right? I only care about apple and oranges. I don't care about bananas yet, right? So I don't have to preemptive strike, pre-anticipate all possible signals to represent them. This is the question. Second, right? Even you are able to build things with wavelets, but how do you build multi-channel right, convolutions, right? Maybe for 2D images, we can use the 2D wavelets, but what about, you know, 2D image with a thousand of channels, right? How do you design basis for operator like this? There's no way, right? There's no theory of doing that. So yet from, 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 from Redo Network, you get all this for free. And for the first time, I, we actually can write down a convolution, deep convolution neural networks, right? In the frequency domain, in the purely white box. There's really no, all the convolutions operators are computed for, right? Except the, the only parameters are physically interesting, right? Uh, uh, epsilon will be the, the granularity, the, the coding uh, error, precision. Lambda is, learn, is learning rate for the gradient descent. Lambda is actually the sorting, um, yeah, choice for. That's it. So finally, you see the, the, this, 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 this big elephant, right? We, we, we talk about very often, right? What the neural network is a monster, right? So they actually start to, to make a good sense about it. If you set your task to be representing your multi-class signals to a incoherent subspace, then you have to lift your signal if you want it to be invariant, right? Lift your signal to multi-channel and uh, separate the sparse codes and the rate reduction, and you can do that in a greedy fashion. That's precisely what the, the Red Bull Network will do it for you. And I'll push the features into this canonical configuration. And everything I mentioned here, by the way, they're actually necessary. They're not something you, you, you come to your mind you know, by trying heuristically, right? You, you don't have sparse code for set class separate. You, you need class coding for class separability. And the deep network is really just the maximize the rate reduction to, to help you to find such a representation, right? In a greedy fashion. A special computing is necessary if you want the environments, okay? You save dramatically uh, in computation than doing the original signal space. Convolution, normalization, non-linearity, everything comes from derived from, 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 from the objective, right? From this objective you wanted. But does this work? They start to work, right? So, um, you know, zero to one is always the hardest step, right? Um, this just demonstrate idea, right? Now you actually can uh, uh, build the networks truly environment to all rotations. We're not talking about the augmentation with five or six orientation. We're talking about every single degrees almost, right? So you can see that after the learning, right? It's truly be able to separate from, this is a training, this is a truly separate. This is a, a, a confusion map for all possible rotations between two letters, right? You can see there's no crosstalk. It gets mapped to completely orthogonal subspaces, right? And it also is tested on all rotations. And this is really the learned representation is environment, right? Rather than, you know, other neural networks learned heuristically. It also works for 10 classes, for translation. I'll skip the details. Uh, also 10 classes, all things actually uh, start to work. By the way, remember uh, I mentioned that, right? Uh, Redo network is constructed in the entirely forward fashion, right? You don't have to do uh, forward. It's very, very natural, very, very simple to do learning now, right? But of course, you see, you also we know each layer is doing optimization. What if you stopped early? Maybe it takes the optimization may take hundred steps to convert to a orthogonal configuration, but what if your memory is limited? You only can allow 30 layers. For example, zebrafish, it doesn't have a large brain as us, right? It has to stop at 30 layers. Then what do you do? The repetition won't be as great, right? But well, you can still do, if you have the labels, just go ahead and do the back propagation, right? The structure is exactly the same, right? Meta structure is exactly the same as ResNet, as, as, as transformers and so on and so forth, right? Do the back propagation as you wish. 
However, you do not have to start with random initialization anymore, right? The forward construction already gave you very good initialization, right? So to last few minutes, I just conclude, uh, uh, yeah, maybe run out, sorry, a uh, little bit longer, but uh, last few slides just conclude, right? What we have learned is, um, so you can see that uh, before, right? If we are uh, dealing with data, do clustering or do the classification, our job is try to find a membership, right? Which data belongs to the same group or which new data point belongs to which cluster, right? We fix the data, data is given to us and we try to optimize against pi, but it's really optimized in the second term, if you realize, right? Uh, the second term here, right? Now here we turn this around, right? In the modern days, if we're allowed to change the data, representing the data, model the data differently, or deform the data from X to Z, then give me, we fix pi, dom, deform Z, right? Then deep network is nothing but just to optimize this objective function through the gradient descent. That's it, right? So basically for all set of learning, supervised, unsupervised, the, you know, the, the representation learning, you're just doing data compression. And the deeper networks is nothing but just the, the optimization scheme to optimize that. Very, very simple. And for people who are familiar with the conventional neural networks, right, this is a 60, 70 years of tradition, right? You really try to fit the output and uh, the architecture is very much trying to error, right? Has taken years of evolution, right? From perceptron to, you know, uh, you know, sigmoid, relu, God knows how many layers, or how many revolution there is gonna take. And that's also initialization is random or you pre-design use wavelets, but you don't really know what to use, right? You have to try basically. And also training, you know, it's all through back propagation, right? So, and also that even you train, it's still a black box. You don't know what you have learned, right? The, the feature, what, what the statistical property of the features, you don't know. You can visualize them, but you really don't, don't have the, any put your fingers on what exactly they're doing. And here, the new perspective is that uh, the optative therapy here, we're trying to do compression, right? Maximize rate uh, reduction or the, the, the way the deep architecture arises as just iterative optimization. And also doesn't have to be gradient descent, right? You can do all, all the optimization algorithm can help you to get a new architectures. And uh, yet, but the good thing about knowing that the, the, the each layer is doing optimization then it's constructed in the forward fashion. And also you can fine tune your network either forward or backward, it's up to you. Right? So make your choice. And the interpretation, every layer is a white box. Every operator at every layer is a white box. Right? You know exactly statistical, um, what the residual they're computing. And the final representation is environment subspaces. Right? So there's a lot of lots of open problems. Right? We know this is a, arguably an intrinsic object function, but why it's so good, right? Even doing clustering, we saw this phase transition, there's no theory yet. Uh, we have guesses, we're working on that, right? This better concentration all helps to explain this. And also robustness of MCR as well. We know there's a 50% of corruption still very, very robust optimizing this object function. Why is that? Uh, we don't know, there's no rigorous theory. And also why this greedy descent allows you to what, under what condition you find the global optimal? We don't know. What's the landscape of this? We don't know. Right, it works, but we don't know. And also, we see a fundamental trade-off between sparsity and invariance. Right, we never really started this problem. You know, sparsity at the, for, for ensemble of signals, how they're separated from other signals. Right, I, we wrote a book of you know on, on, on this, but we start to realize this is the problem barely nobody has touched. And also that when you have here, we talk about one side of the story, fix pi, learn Z, fix Z, learn pi, right? But in reality, if you don't have the correct labels, uh, you probably want to do join, join optimization, right? This is something also we're working on. The architecture arises from optimization, right? We know the Redo network come from optimization. And the question then, once you realize that everything, every knowledge, principal knowledge you have about optimization helps build a better architecture. Right, acceleration that will introduce skip connections between cross layers. In practice, people do find that's helpful. You know, how do you formalize that? And also, there's a tons of structures, by the way, in between C and E. We barely scratch the surface. There's a lot of uh, they share a lot of common structures, right? And also, what are other in practice people also use very short, as sparse, uh, or separable convolutions, right? 
Uh, under what condition those assumptions are valid? We don't know, right? Those are all living for futures. Also, we know the rotation translation works for other groups, right? If you want the homography, 3D rotation, and other more complicated groups, what other associated architecture uh, uh, operators? We don't know, right? There's also people that, uh, you know, interpreting the role of networks as kernels. So you're actually staring at a kernel right in the front of you, right? So to compute this quantity, you don't need the covariance matrix, by the way. You only need the inner product between the data, by the way, right? And that's the, the inner product is the Euclidean kernel. You can replace that with any kernel of your choice, either learned or pre-designed, right? Then this actually everything else interpretation is exactly the same. You can handle some extra linearity and so on and so forth. So how to extend, right? There's a lot of other possible extensions, right? Here, the, we talk about the invariants to group transformations, right? But, the, but the in real world data, there's going to be dynamical uh, structure, also graphical structures. There's a lot of work about the graph with neural networks and so on. But I want to say one thing, doesn't matter what you do, right? You need to think about what are you compressing, right? You, through this process, you must gain from that, right? From the dynamic data, from graphical data, you have to make that clear. And also once we now know that the neural network is nothing but doing learning the low-dimensional structures, right? Now we can potentially make this process more robust and transferable, right? If we are able to identify those structures correctly. Um, the whole talk we talk about the encoding, right? Transforming X to Z. We haven't talked about the other side, right? To truly evaluate how good your representations are, you need to consider how you can be decoded back to the original space. Right, the auto encoding. That's actually what we need for future. That's also something my students are working on. Um, finally, right, uh, after our work, we post our work online. I, I start to get a lot of emails from neuroscientists. They actually tell tells us, uh, uh, you know, a lot of things we, we said make sense to them, right? Um, they said that uh, they already know that the for you know, neurons are actually computing in frequency, not in amplitude. And also that uh, there's recent work from Caltech group that really says that in high, high level cortex, we representing the identity of a face actually using subspace, about 200 face cells. And each cells are not, they're not the encoding prototypes. They're actually encoding the coordinates, right? Any superposition representing a very sharp face images. Right? Those are the references for the work. As you can see, it also really connects to the, the, the family of work we did with from a compression point of view to look at clustering classification. Now just you know using the same principle for representation learning. Right, deep networks just arise from there as the optimization scheme. Right? Also, there's a new textbook I just wrote, give you a slightly more broader context of the low dimensional models. And we just started, um, don't try to compare our work with the 10 years of uh, Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft engineers yet, right? But we do have a white box neural redu network. We share the GitHub, GitHub Google Colab and Jupyter book with all the examples, real data, and so on and so forth. But you will see that this is what going to transform very quickly in the next few months. Uh, we're trying to engineer. There's already very good work in policy research work. This actually scales very, very well uh, to large number of classes, high large set of data. So if you forget everything I said today, just, just remember this slogan, right? I put it here, right? A deep convolution neural networks architectures. I'm not talking about the optimization, refining the neural network. The architecture, layer by layer, are nothing but iterative optimization scheme for compressing your data correctly. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, I, I take a few more, yeah, extra few minutes. Thank you, Yi. That was really fascinating. I really appreciate it. Actually, uh, one of my group members presented their Red Unit paper at our group meeting yesterday, so we had an opportunity to come up with quite a few questions about it. But we have a particularly large group of participants, and rather than um, me dominating too much of the time. I just want to ask you two questions and then open it up for everybody. So first, a high level question. So you have focused, um, it seems like, primarily on classification problems. So I work on inverse problem science, especially interested in the uh, regression problems. Do you think the same um, kind of coding rate reduction principle is uh, applicable to regression problems? That's a fascinating problem. I would be very hesitant to talk about it. Okay. That's exactly on my mind. Actually, I will talk about it. <laughs> yes, indeed, right? So ever since uh, the, the first that we work about the Redu network, even, even before Redu network, when we, when we first worked out the, um, the rate reduction, we actually realized and there's a fundamental connection, you know, you can connect to regression problem. 
Yes, regression will be, imagine you are basically regressing infinitely many labels, right? Okay. Yeah. And so we already have discussion in the how to extend to, especially for control problems. Uh, maybe you are, you're interested in image property, right? For control, right? Optimal control. That's exactly yeah. tells me, right? On each state, what my action should be. Right. It's just a more complicated the classification problem, right? Um, and also you can see uh, why the low dimensional problem plays a role guys here, right? right? Uh, because, um, if you think about the, 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 the alpha goal, right? People do all the reinforced learning, right? Actually, it's not any smart, clever sampling scheme or my computer is fast. In fact, the reason it admits a scalable solution, you can get rid of, you can build a policy based on only a few thousand features rather than astronomical state space. Because, right, your optimal strategy only depend the value only depends on very low dimensional space, right? Identify those low dimensional structure. They may not be linear, right? That's why neural network is doing. So how to identify that the low dimensional structure feature spaces that your value function depends on is a key. Right. And there are actually two, uh, so really, really start to realize the neural network is really is a hammer. It helps to hammer out what are those low dimensional subspaces if they're nonlinear, make them linear. That's really what it does to compress them in the direction you want it, right? Through so gradient descent, through, through random search, but that's really the role. It really helps to identify those low dimensional structure for you. And then your regression is nothing but a much lower dimensional function defined on those low dimensional manifolds, right? right? If you agree. Uh, so this actually helps to formalize what the truly even reinforced learning folks are doing, right? Remember, uh, one thing, almost all the uh, policy learning, right? Look at the form, ultimate form of the policy function. It's always a linear combination of the features. They are linearize everything. Okay. Although this whole process, they just lump into this big black box, right? Uh, simultaneously identify those low dimensional structure, linearize them, so that the final value function will be a linear superposition of those features, right? Or the policy gradient descent all relies on, or even the inverse reinforced learning, right? Formulation is all doing that, right? So that's all I have to say, really that I think conceptually they're exactly the same problem if you think about it, but of course, technically it will be much harder, right? You have to deal with the functional spaces and so on and so forth, right? You are dealing with not finite classes anymore, right? But I will be curious to see what are the associated, what are the sort of generalization of the rate reduction must be something intrinsic about the function you're looking for, simplicity of the function you're looking for, right? Measure the final representation, but you have to be clear about that. Okay. Yeah. I'm other... sure there's no rate, yeah. Thank you. The, my other question seems a little bit lower level. If you don't mind going back to slide 37 in equation seven. Um, so prior to that point in the talk, Z is a dependent variable, right? Z is a, you know, F of X comma theta, and we're kind of working on theta. At this point, there's no X in equation seven. So you've written an optimization problem, but it doesn't seem to depend on the data anymore. So can you help a little bit uh, <laughs> with uh, insight there? Uh, X, Z is, Z zero is X. You started with X. Yeah, um, I understand that once you start optimizing it, but equation seven itself, the principle in equation seven doesn't have an X in it, right? It appears in yeah. equation eight, but isn't there, shouldn't there be some way to uh, so, have the data in your- So Yes, so the Z, think about it, you're solving a differential equation. The dependency of Z is on the, the initial condition is X. Okay. So your solution, your path is a function of the initial condition. That's a dependency. So imagine you started from this blue point, those are the X. Yeah, I understand right? equation eight. Um, yeah, so this is exactly what it does, right? So uh, this start with Z, Z zero, L equals zero is exactly those blue points at this configuration. From there, that's the initial condition, X Z, uh, Z zero is equal to X. Then from then on, you do the incremental deformation. Take the iteration. Yeah, actually, you can you just a misnomer. You can call it X L, right, or Z L. Using it's the same. Okay. You can call it X zero, X L, X L plus one, and so on and so forth. It's the same. 
All right, we could, we, I'll, I want to give other people a chance to ask questions. I get to meet you tomorrow, we can discuss it more. So I will open it up to anybody now who has questions. You can unmute yourself or type something in the chat as you wish. Thank you, Yi. Yeah. Any more questions? I, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Um, so so um, I, I was, I, I'm not as much familiar with this um, understanding inside the neural network and you kind of trying to clear that up here. Um, but if you would be using a distribution like in Bayesian um, deep neural, how that will be different, uh, where exactly it will become different? Uh... What do you mean by BS in neural network? Uh, what is trying to do? So Bayesian will be like in place of a, a scalar number, you start with a distribution of your choice. Typically it will be normal distribution. Um, but if you start reducing, uh, yeah, like um, one of the convergence plots you're showing, uh, uh, so 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 what what is objective, right? So here here is the thing uh, we. Uh, one thing we deviate from uh, many of the previous work is that we no longer make the study of networks as objective. We make the study of data as objective. So, so what is the task you want to do with the data? What do you want to learn the structure of the data? Uh, perform task subsequently. We make that the objective. You know, if you make the study of certain network, it's endless. I can come up with gazillions of networks, right? First layers, uh, one layer, two layer, three layer, right? Each one, it's, it turns out, in fact, you know, uh, so I, I was at, a, uh, had a, uh, at Harvard giving this talk, I mean, people ask, you know, maybe the networks, they're, you know, uh, the reason why people use certain networks because they are very expressive, right? Very, um, you know, that kind of universal representation power, right? Uh, that is really not any, uh, it's really a bad way to look at a neural network, right? If you do that, the uh, Fourier series is, can be a universal approximator, right? A single layer neuron can be a uh, layer neural network, can be a uh, generalized, uh, can be a universal operator. Why don't you use that? Or why not other graphical models, right? So once you use study the networks as objective, I think that's really counterproductive. Right, maybe certain class of object uh, network is uh, is worth study. For example, the the the, the founder random network. We know what the functions are, but you just come up with arbitrary network structure, right? And also, you know that the uh, and uh, 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 you the, to study it, it's very hard to say, you know, what 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 you, you know it does to the data or what is the ultimate task. How do I measure, um, compare things? Which one is better? Which one's worse? So, so the, the reason I was saying is that you are starting with the X and then gradually through mapping, um, yeah. going to higher dimensions of Z and converging to the final um, like identification of the object. Um, yeah. Bayes, Bayesian will also tr start with a wide band and then gradually it will minimize to get to the object. Uh, so, I, I mean, it's not the same method as I understand, but the, the conceptually it sounds like similar. That's what I was trying to understand. Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, so this, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not quite familiar with the uh, Bayesian neural network. What he's trying to do, or um, in this context. Um, okay. okay. Yeah. And, and and I have a second question. Um, the idea is that when you have like a blue and red different objects you're trying to identify, um, in sometimes um, because the algorithms are around the mill type algorithms you use in, in applications, a lot of times you'll go to the domain knowledge um, owner and ask, hey, I'm not being able to do that convergence very well, so I'll add additional sensors to bring in more data. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, if you do that one, would that make this process in a, your function structure become different once you implement? So, so you start with, let's say, five different sensors, mm -hmm. and then you gradually add three more sensors, make it eight. So when you implement this process using five sensors 
and then add three more, would your uh, mapping structure become different? It will be different. By the way, uh, that's a very good question. So um, sort of related to this. Um, so you, if you, um, uh, so this is a process, right? Just to try to optimize gradient descent uh, delta R. And there's no guarantee actually will converge. If you give a very hard task, the distribution is very bad. It's barely separable. Uh, this process will not be very effective, right? For example, right. we want to separate the images. Turns out what we found out in our experiment, you see the more channel you use, actually better. Basically, especially they're se more separable, right? You give more space to, to, to the algorithm to wiggle around. So it's sort of make an analogy to what you said. If five features or five sensors are not enough because maybe the data is not that separable, right? The two classes. So th this algorithm will not do the impossible, okay? Mm -hmm. And also it's a very basic, even from the optimization point of view, right? The neural network is doing something very incremental, by the way, layer by layer. So it's not even doing anything global, right? How however, if the data is corroborating, right? Especially in, when we do images, you can see that uh, later on, we, we, the students, we actually struggle because of the limit of K, uh, computation, they actually use five channels. Actually, that turns out it takes a lot of intuition. Later on, they start to realize that if you just use a few more channels, suddenly all 10 classes are very easily separable and with a much fewer layers. Okay, so those are the things we do on, on our fully understand, but it sort of conceptually tells you if you gave the, the, the algorithm more separable data, the intrinsic structures are more separable, this process will work much, much easier. Hence, adding channels or adding new sensors to make different classes more distinguishable will definitely help the algorithm to find the subspace, push them to the orthogonal subspace much, much easier. Right. Yeah. So, so, so a situation is like, if you go to the engineer who has that problem is the problem owner sometimes they will identify a, another sensor they will so this will exactly separate this mm -hmm. uh, identification from all other um, all other messy identification and that becomes much more simpler yeah thank yeah. you and if, if it, maybe five sensor is enough maybe see the point is that maybe your your optimization your locator is not designed your optimization you know you know we all know right if you are to solving some non linear optimization problem the optimization strategy or path matters a lot right so maybe that five, you know, five dimensions is already separable, five sensors, already, but you, you just, your, your particular, this neural network is just not good enough for that. Could be, or there's some non-linearity cannot handle very, very well. So hence give you a little bit of wiggle room, give more channels will make the job much easier. So, so those are the two really complementary uh, angles. One thing can improve the design of the network so that, or the algorithm, so that for wider, broader conditions, you can actually converge to the right structure. On the other hand, again, in practice, you can give the, uh, the, the, the network, whatever you have, a simpler job, right? To, by engineering, the, gave the network uh, the features that is more separable to begin with, right? So here, I didn't talk about this, right? So uh, to find a sparse code, you know, there's a whole literature, a whole industry about how to find a sparse code, right? Correctly, they learn the dictionary. Here, we just use random. This is what we did so far is extremely naive. We just hit it with random filters. But in practice, you can do so much better, right? You can learn the filters so that those sparse code will be much more accurate, much more separable. Then the subsequent network will have a much easier job to do, right? Rather than starting from less separable sparse codes, okay? So this is really sort of uh, connects to every component needs to be function at its best, right? But this leaves us the, the possibility in the future to engineer every piece correctly or better at least. Yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. Anyone have a last quick question? We're getting late in the day here in Eastern time zone. Mm -hmm. Maybe one more quick question and then we'll... Anybody? If not, thank you again, Yi. That was really, uh, really uh, inspiring seminar. I really appreciate your time. And I look forward to uh, discussing some more with you tomorrow. Yes, yes. I have a lot of meetings with you guys, many of you tomorrow. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks a lot for having me. And uh, again, yeah, uh, have, you, have a good day. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.